Chapter 6. Plutocracy The transfer of wealth from the working classes to the upper class has been going on for many years, by a number of tactics. First, the rich own the workplaces, as I discussed earlier. They also own all the financial institutions. For instance, the Federal Reserve is a consortium of private banks that collects interest on all of our money. Second, the rich pay lower tax rates than the rest of us. Many of them find ways to evade taxes altogether. Yet they reap many benefits from government services that we taxpayers support. Third, some corporations manage to get authorization of limited liability. The nuclear power plants and the largest banks and the largest oil companies are too big to fail. These corporations don't have to pay for their mistakes, so they have little incentive for avoiding mistakes, and some of their mistakes are huge. This arrangement is known as socializing the risks and costs while privatizing the profits, or more briefly as socialism for the rich. Also, the recent epidemic of foreclosures stems mostly from fraud, most of which is not being prosecuted. By all of these means and others, wealth is being concentrated into ever fewer hands, to a much greater degree than most people in our society realize. The USA has become one of the world's leaders in economic inequality. We're moving into a plantation economy and feudalism. The middle class is being erased, and with it democracy. The wealthy few have much greater influence than the rest of us, and they use that influence to make themselves still wealthier and more influential, by subsidizing politicians and media that support their interests. Political candidates who have little money are described by the corporate press as not serious candidates, if the press mentions them at all. It never mentioned my own 2010 run for Congress, nor did it give Congressman Dennis Kucinich his fair turn in the presidential candidates' debates in 2007 and 2008. During the program, Dennis was not asked a question by host George Stephanopoulos until a third of the way through the debate. The question was about prayer, and Dennis answered, George, uh, I've been standing here for the last 45 minutes praying to God you were going to call on me. <laughs> Nowadays, it's nearly impossible to get elected to public office without expensive advertisements, which require large campaign donations from the wealthy. Fans of Obama boasted that he collected more small donations than any other candidate in history. Many of them are unaware that he also collected more large donations than any other candidate in history. Thus, public officials end up serving the interests of the wealthy as lackeys or dupes, or as members of the wealthy class themselves. Most members of Congress are far wealthier than the ordinary folks they purport to represent. As a result, many members of Congress have little understanding of, or interest in, the lives of ordinary people. Our government has become a tool of the plutocracy. That is, we have rule by the wealthy few, for the benefit of the wealthy few. The winner-take-all board game of Monopoly would be a stupid model for a national economy, even if the rules were constant. But it's even worse if one of the rules is that the wealthiest players get to rewrite the rules whenever they like. And the laws may appear to apply equally to all, but it is, as Anatole France said, the law, in its majestic equality, forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges to beg in the streets, and to steal bread. We call ourselves a democracy, but few of us get to vote in our workplace about how the workplace is run, even though that's where we spend most of our time. And none of us get to vote in our shopping mall about how the economy is run. Although I could be mistaken about this, I believe the plutocracy is not a tightly knit hierarchical conspiracy, like Hitler's inner circle, or the fabled Illuminati. Indeed, if it were, its few members would be taking better care of this planet that they own and control, not rushing it toward ecocide. I think that a more accurate picture of the plutocracy was painted by Jeff Foe in his 2006 book, The Global Class War. He showed the plutocracy more like a fraternity or a country club. 
Its members form a loose network with a shared philosophy and an internal spirit of camaraderie, but no more than that. They may sometimes work together or help each other out, but they may just as often compete against each other, like different mafia families fighting for control of a city. The members of the plutocracy are not all-powerful. They are themselves driven by market forces, and they see themselves as separate from each other. Recall the philosophy of separateness I discussed earlier. Each is chiefly concerned with this question, what can I do to protect and improve my own financial position? And so they are plundering what remains of the commons. They are destroying it, not as a conscious intention, but as a side effect of their lack of concern, as they attempt to make a quick buck for themselves. Corporations are designed not to benefit the public, but to maximize profits by any means available, ignoring or even concealing adverse effects to workers, consumers, the general public, and the ecosystem. The film The Corporation explained that if corporations are persons, then those persons are psychopaths, indifferent to the fate of others. That film compared a corporation to a shark. It's an efficient externalizing machine, but that is simply its nature. It is not consciously malevolent. Another useful metaphor was given by Annie Leonard in her film about the Citizens United court decision. She depicts a corporation as a mindless robot that simply follows its programming. There are people inside the robot. They are like gears and cogs in the machine. But that robot will quickly fire and replace anyone who starts to put people above profit. Publicly traded corporations are now required by law and the markets to pursue one single motivation above all others. Maximize value for shareholders. Make as much money as possible. That's it. No, really, that's what the law and the markets demand. Imagine a friend saying, the only thing I care about is money. It's not someone you'd want to leave your kids with, or your democracy for that matter. Yes, it is people who run these corporations, but their human motivations come second. If they prioritize anything at all over maximizing profits, they're out of there. Can corporate leaders do good things like give to charity or try to be more green? Sure, but not if it conflicts with maximum profits. John Perkins, author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman, tells an anecdote about his encounter with a corporate executive who had lost a battle to Perkins's environmentalist group. The executive, who was also a father, subsequently thanked the environmentalists for giving him cover to make changes without getting fired. The wealthy classes looting of the working classes can be described as class war. Sometimes the war is overtly violent, for instance when corporate thugs murder labor organizers. At other times the violence is merely implied. The ill-gotten gains of the rich are, quote, legally, unquote, protected by police who carry handcuffs, pepper spray, tasers, and guns. Financiers who destroy the economy are more likely to be bailed out than prosecuted. The plutocracy's biggest advantage in the class war is in the fact that most working people don't even know there is a class war. The existence of the class war is denied by the plutocracy, which would rather the public not notice how it is being screwed. That denial is also assisted by some members of the public, who would prefer not to be aware that they're being screwed, since they can't do anything about it anyway. But lately some parts of the class war have become more visible. In early 2011, Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin and several other political officials declared war very openly on labor unions. This led to massive protests in Wisconsin and was one of the inspirations for the subsequent Occupy Wall Street movement. The class war has recently changed its nature in other ways as well. The plutocracy has long been a parasite on the working classes, but it was a biotrophic parasite. That's the kind that permits the host to live. Recently the plutocracy has stepped up its rate of exploitation and can now be classified as a necrotrophic parasite. That's the kind that eventually kills its host. Clearly this situation can't continue much longer. Part of the reason that so few Americans have been aware of the class war is because, as I mentioned earlier, 
The plutocracy controls the mass media, and they only promote the worldview that they want to believe. Most think tanks work to further develop that view, particularly ever since the Powell Memorandum of 1971. But I take some encouragement from what Naomi Klein said about this. It's easy to be discouraged by how much more funding the right-wing think tanks have. You know, Seth said the Fraser Institute, they've got six million dollars. Well, here's the thing. They need that money. They need that money, and they need Can West, and they need CTV, and they need Bell. They need it because they have a really tough intellectual job. Their job, well, I'll quote Milton Friedman in a letter to Augusto Pinochet in 1975. He said, the major error, in my opinion, is to believe it's possible to do good with other people's money. Their job is to convince people that by trying to do good, you do bad. And by being, doing bad, by pursuing your most selfish desires, you do good. Crazy, crazy talk. Very expensive to convince people of something so deeply counterintuitive. It is much cheaper, much cheaper, to convince people that to do good is good, bad, bad. Because we know this. We already know.